Welcome to Pitch It To Me Podcast, a show about the subjective past, present, and potential future of flesh and blood design. Today's episode will be Pitch and Predictions Rosetta, part two, where we use facts and figures to prove once and for all that we have no idea what we're talking about. On Red Pitch, we talk about how LSS has reimagined the realm of Aria. On Yellow Pitch, we speculate as to how this set will impact the meta. And on Blue Pitch, Joel tallies up the score between the hosts and the audience. You can find us across all socials, such as TikTok and Instagram at Pitch to Me Podcast. I'm Clark. I'm Fuzzy. And I'm Joel. How was everyone's pre-release? It was pretty good. I enjoyed seeing my friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's what pre-release is all about. Yeah. Any spicy pulls? Yeah, I got two Marvels. A uh, Marvel Sigil of Conductivity and a Marvel Sigil of Forethought. They're not the most playable. They're not the <laughs> most money. But you know what? They're big, shiny, pretty cards, and we take those. Asilio just kind of needs to be cracked wide open eventually, and then all the Marvels are going to be really expensive. Oh, (laughs) especially because he can play so many of them, right? He gets amp one for every Marvel that leaves the field when you crack your gloves. (laughs) Every sigil that leaves the field. And they're so beautiful. I don't care if they don't, like, cost any, or not cost anything. I don't care if they don't have any value, but they look gorgeous. Yeah, Yeah, just hang them on your wall. Yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> put a nail right through them. <laughs> Might as well. You're not going to play it in the deck. <laughs> Did anybody feel like the format was unbalanced? I know there's a lot of like buzz online where oh, Florian yeah. seems to be a lot stronger in sealed than the other heroes. That was everyone's first impression. I mean, as someone yeah. who played Florian in three of my four pre-releases, yeah, Florian's pretty strong. Florian also just has a ton of agency in ability to like put power cards to the bottom Mm -hmm. and like have the tools that he needs to deal with every other hero in a way that I feel like everyone else might struggle with. Yeah. He's got a lot of tools for sure. Take this with a grain of salt, but it really felt like the outsider sealed environment or limited environment where you want to jam a lot of life gain. And maybe this is just like what I first experienced and it was different as the pre-releases like, uh, went on over the weekend, but it just felt like life gain was so absurdly strong. And if you didn't have a lot of that element, then you probably weren't going to have a very good pre-release. Yeah. Cause on my, on my first pre-release, I pulled uh felling of the crown and both of the meld majestics for room blade. Wow. And I still ended up like doing terribly just cause like whatever I did, my opponent would gain twice that amount of life. It felt like. Yeah, it was very easy to have a high density of life gain in in sealed in a way that I don't think will translate over to limited and therefore will be more restrictive. I think right Mm -hmm. now there is a big buzz around Florian and Earth being like overpowered, but Mm -hmm. it's going to start to even out and pull towards the middle as as everyone starts realizing, oh, if I'm a lightning hero. Life gain is really important for me. So in this draft, I'm going to prioritize gaining the generic life gain. Mm -hmm. And then those Mm. earth decks where they just ran like two red arcane polarities plus all their fertile grounds. That's not going to be as easy to pull off anymore because everyone is trying to get their hands on those cards. Sure. Right. It's almost kind of like this is the issue with doing an eight pack sealed, right? And they introduced the idea of eight pack sealed in part the mist veil. And that was awesome and wonderful. Everyone agreed that it made you feel like you could play any hero that you wanted to a good degree of competency in the deck. But now I guess with this set, we're kind of seeing, well, when there's one type of card that you want to be restricted, it can show up a lot in an Mm. eight pack sealed environment. Mm. And therefore it can uh, come to define the deck and the strategy. Yeah, I wonder if Apex Sealed actually leads to the same hero being played more often because it enables you to play any hero you want in your pool, almost no matter what you have, right? Like, it's hard to have a hero that you can't play. And so when everyone knows that one hero is the strongest, that effect can be amplified. It can be Mm -hmm. um, fancy statistics word for (laughs) the data is weird. (laughs) 
It can skew it. Yeah, skew. <laughs> Great. <laughs> skew it yeah. further. Yeah. Anyway, that's our little musings. I definitely really enjoyed playing Lightning Heroes. Those were my favorite. Like, kind of every pool, I'd be like, can I play Aurora? Can I play Asilio? Because I love those heroes oh, so much. Yeah. Me too, buddy. Like, every <laughs> single draft, I was looking at my four Lightning Reds, and I'm like, I can do something with this, right? Right? <laughs> like, I can make this work somehow. <laughs> and I never could until the last one where I finally got a good Aurora pool, and it mm. was so much fun. I'm probably going to play Aurora in CC. Cheesh! No, don't say that, Fuzzy. Now all the AGE Pro team will know what you're taking to the tournament. If they listen to my podcast, they can have my secrets. (laughs) (laughs) All right. With that being said, let's uh, talk about the future a little bit. Next week, we will not have a normal episode for you guys. We will instead be doing a special announcement about some uh, upcoming future plans that we're going to be prepping for. So keep an eye out for that. So today's episode is going to be part two of our pitch and predictions. Whenever a set is on the horizon, we like to call our shots and try to say as much about what we think the set will contain or what it will be like. And then after the set releases, we actually like to go back and check off which of our predictions we got correct and which we got wrong in a hilarious act of self-deprecation as we say, haha, look how wrong we were. This time, we got our Discord users involved and we collected a bunch of their predictions as well. So you'll hear us shout out those Discord users as they gave our predictions months ago. And I assume they want us to rehash it <laughs> online <laughs> in this uh part two episode we'll find out <laughs> i mean if we're making fun of ourselves for being wrong i'd say it's only fair to make fun of them for being wrong exactly in in pitum you get a two for one special <laughs> we don't just get you involved for one episode we had one q a that was good for two episodes that's value value <laughs> it's value for your buck yeah let's talk about our red pitch which is uh talking about how lss is redefining aria clark you want to take it away Yes, so for Red Pitch, I want you all to come with me and you'll see a whole world of pure imagination. AKA, they reimagined Aria. Can I eat the deadwood trees? Yes. You'll die, (laughs) but you can. (laughs) You'll die. Yeah, everything is poisonous and will kill you. Oh. In the rotwood. (laughs) So, LSS took us back to Aria and reimagined the talents. Uh, Whenever we talk about Aria, it sort of has this weird veil of like being the COVID set over it. And it was unbalanced and like kind of not fun as a result. And we don't really like what it did to CC. And that's sort of the whole conversation around Aria. But there were a lot of interesting ideas encapsulated in Tales of Aria some of which they've held on to and others they've gotten rid of and replaced with new ideas that I'm really excited to talk about here. So for example, two of the big things that they got rid of from Tales of Aria, there's no more fuse and there's no more elemental cards. Yeah, I was expecting fuse cards in the set, I'm not going to lie. And I was really expecting elemental cards to be there. It's in the type line of these heroes, but that's more of a convention that way they can work homogeneously with the old lightning and elemental and earth rune blade cards, you know? Yeah. The whole essence of idea felt very strange as to why that needed to be a keyword in the text box rather than a defining characteristic of the hero card at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So they do have to sort of hold on to this previous idea that they had which makes it all a little weird, but I do like that they are stepping away from elemental as like the generic, like just make the cards generic and then you're able to present new cards to way more heroes in the set. Mm -hmm. I think I was just like really excited for wild fusion to make a comeback. Not that it was ever hinted at all by LSS, but I'm just like hearkening back to our, uh, custom card design contest uh, mm-hmm. and I think one of the winners or runner-ups uh, designed Wild Fusion um, and I thought it was a cool mechanic. Yeah, no no fusion at all, which, I mean, it was already a clunky-ass mechanic anyway, so it makes the elemental decks like way more consistent and you can use their kit to their fullest potential, but yeah. yeah. 
Now I want to talk about the talents. Earth. Earth is different now. We've gotten rid of one element of Earth, which was the recursive aspect of it. And rather than recursion, we now have this decompose mechanic, right? Which is this idea of you still want a bunch of Earth cards in your graveyard, but now instead of putting them back into your deck, you're banishing them for extra effects and to turn on hero abilities, which is a way more interesting mechanic, in my opinion. I like it as the evolution of Earth, too. If Rosetta's representing the spring, summer versus the autumnal fading of time, like I think that's a cool way to represent the tension is banishing Earth cards out of your graveyard in order to fuel your effects, decomposing, you know? Yeah, rather than the eternal summer, which was kind of like keeping it rolling, baby. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also felt like the recursion of the Earth cards in OG Tales of Aria was like just recurring more Earth cards that recur more Earth cards. And it just didn't seem like there was like a solid like end game state. And now they've gotten rid of it and defined the what the end game looks like for the Earth heroes. And that's to turn on the hero powers mostly. Yeah, turn on these overrate, very powerful hero abilities. Um, but we also see some of the elements that were established in Aria continue with Earth. Big attack and big block are still here, right? A lot Slay. of the a lot of the cards that were Earth or Earth synergistic. Uh, focused around gaining additional power or gaining additional block. And that is still present here, right? I'm thinking Cadaverous Contraband and Rootbound Carapace, right? Both of them have decomposed mechanics that increase the power of the attack or the defense of the defense reaction. There aren't too many other things. I guess there is still the embodiment of Earth synergy that's sort of present throughout the set, right? The new legendary chess piece for Earth, I think, is really cool. I think it's cool that they brought that out of just Briar, right? We've had multiple two Earth heroes in the past, and Briar was the only one who could make the embodiment. Imagining Oldham with an embodiment of Earth is something that you can do now that you couldn't do before. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really nice the way that they put it into the set. Right now, embodiment of Earths are either delayed through an aura being destroyed an on-hit for an attack, or you have to banish Earth cards from your graveyard every single turn. Or you can just have the chess piece and uh, be annoying <laughs> and just have a ton of block value, which is certainly good in its own right. The newest and biggest thing for Earth, though, is life gain. Earth has now gotten this very meaningful life gain theme running throughout it. What do we think about life gain as a consistent mechanic in flesh and blood? Because I know that in the past, I've expressed some apprehension towards it. Yeah, I definitely plan on talking about this more in Yellow Pitch as we talk about how it changes the meta. <laughs> I think in the class identity of Earth, it seems like a very fair place to silo the mechanic a little bit where like if there was a class slash talent to get life gain i'm very comfortable with earth getting it mm -hmm. i think it matches their idea of playing really passively slash like defensively and then having this inevitability late game i think life gain works with that identity and in earth because there's no crazy mechanics like aggro has their lightning fast and on hits and giving lots of crazy go agains but Earth has a much more like, this is one potential threat per turn. And the life gain feels a little bit fair there because it's a very similar weakness to what it had before. If you're going too fast for Earth, life gain isn't really going to help them that much. Mm -hmm. Me personally, like I knew eventually that there was going to be a life gain centric class or talent or whatever that would be printed. And I already don't like where it's going, but it makes sense that it's in the Earth set since we already had like uh, Invigorate in um, Tales of Aria. Mm -hmm. And now they're kind of like exploring that like niche part of that set in Rosetta, which is cool. Like, I think it definitely gives a lot of cushion. And uh, because Crown of Seed is not available any longer, I think this is a really good way of prolonging the game without breaking the core mechanics of flesh and blood in an egregious way. So, I mean, yeah. take, take what you can get. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Now they didn't just touch Earth, they also touched Lightning. So Lightning still has a very strong emphasis on go again or gaining go again or go again being important to the class, right? I'm looking at Second Strike here. I'm looking at Fry as a card, which bothers me, but I can move through it. <laughs> I don't know why it has to be zero block. Just make it head jab with lightning at the bottom. I guess, I guess head jab being lightning is too strong. <laughs> I guess that's just too good for this world. <laughs> um, gotta have zero block. If they could, uh, Fry could have been the first one block card. <laughs> LSS had an opportunity. And it would have been cool because you could have organized your hand in order of block. You could go like zero, one, two, three, four. Sure. <laughs> if you're a lightning hero. Yeah. <laughs> um, we also still see a little bit of a return with uh, damage on hit. It kind of only really shows up in Burn Up Shock, but Burn Up, whoo, what a card. What a card. I love my Rune Grenade. It do the damage. It do be you doing just, damage. Do you say Rune Grenade? Yeah, Rune Grenade. It's the nickname for the card. Wait, why do I love that? That's cool. Yeah, it's sick. So still this focus on like, Landing on hits are important and help you deal more damage. Uh, still much, much smaller. I would say lightning probably got the least amount of interesting things there in terms of like building on what they sort of already had designed in Aria versus Earth. I think Earth gained more in more interesting ways than I would say lightning did. But lightning got the coolest fucking third thing ever, which is bounce. Bounce synergies are so cool. This is the coolest thing that they've ever added to the game. <laughs> I attack you with my attack. It flip, 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 goes back into my hand. I play it again. Yeah. Wait, I'm, what does it do? It flip, 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 goes back into my hand. <laughs> <laughs> now backwards. Flip, flip, flip. <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. Using blink with gone in a flash to bounce it in the resolution step. The game still seeing that it had go again. I mean... There's just so many cool things that you can do using blast to oblivion to like re up your value on your channel lightning valley. I mean, if you couldn't guess that I would love this mechanic after our swashbuckler episode, like <laughs> you are not paying attention to what Clark likes in card games. <laughs> I think lightning feels in a much better spot compared to where it was before. I think like all of these talents from Arya, save for maybe ice because it got uprising, like felt a little bit hollow like they just needed a little something more to actually make them interesting i think lightning's problem before was that like they had cards with go again and cards that gave other stuff go again and you're like cool i don't need those two things together i don't need to give go again go again again you, you get yeah, what i'm mm -hmm. saying yeah now it seems like lightning has a lot more cards that when you play them in conjunction you get pseudo go again mm -hmm. uh like on on this like it takes two cards to give one thing go again but you get benefits for, for playing multiple cards and replaying the stuff that you bounce with other lightning cards. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really cool. Um, and I think it gives lightning much more of an identity than um, Earth, let alone uh, Ice. And I love the the instant synergies, right? That's yeah. something you haven't even mentioned, Clark. Like the synergy with instants being baked into the card, being like an extra hoop you can jump through in order to get a bonus effect. I think that is very on flavor with lightning, you know? A lightning strike is an instant ability and like mm -hmm. things changing at the split second and being able to react to it i think is really cool on flavor and i actually have been really enjoying it in gameplay mm -hmm. moving on i also still want to note that they did not completely ignore the elemental class side of these talents uh earth bond and lightning flow were two brand new mechanics that were printed maybe not in rosetta they were rosetta first strike so i want to point this out because one that's kind of signaling to me that the next time we see ice, we might see a similar thing like uh, like Earth Bond and Lightning Flow. And it's also telling me that the next time that we see Earth show up again, maybe for when we uh, get an adult Terra or, mm. you know, some idea of like an old him replacement, like that mechanic may may make another comeback. So. I would say that it's cool that they didn't completely leave out these elemental room blade, elemental uh, guardian cards that still cared about, you know, the talent itself. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. 
Now, they didn't just reimagine the talents in this set. They also reimagined the classes. Runeblade and Wizard kind of got some facelifts in this set. And I'm going to be completely honest. I think they really needed them. It had been over 600 days since Wizard was printed in a booster product. That's a long time. It's an extremely long time. And so... I think it's really great, the new direction of Wizard. So for one, Wizards are way more attack action oriented. They are not just Kano clones of, well, I have to run nothing but non-attack action cards. No, they can run some instants and some attack actions. They can do lots of things. They don't have to be focused around this one singular strategy. We also see that Surge was a mechanic that existed in the past and else at kept trying to make it a thing and i feel like the community was like stop trying to make surge a thing surge is never yeah. going to be hip or cool and then they were <laughs> like but what about amp and we're like okay lss lss okay we'll, we'll take a <laughs> yeah. little bit of surge <laughs> <laughs> they have felt like a lot more comfortable printing larger amounts of amp you know Mm -hmm. like kindle was a little crazy Lulu a card that amps you one like normally you're amping like one two three you have to really work hard for it ether wildfire is crazy because of all the amp it's giving when you play it right mm -hmm. this might be wrong but it's like in tune with this like episode's identity but like do you think they printed surge as like a testing of the waters to see what wizard players would do with surge and then basically honed their design of what wizards would use in uh, this all arcane set, like ahead of time. You know what I mean? I could totally see a soft version of that. Like they wanted to print Surge in order to expand on the wizard design space. They noticed that it is a very like weak quote unquote mechanic. It's like hard to turn on. So they were able mm -hmm. to increase the rewards after seeing what the com community has done with it. Maybe not necessarily like we're using Dynasty as a testing grounds for Rosetta, but in a like they're continuously ready to go back to old mechanics and see if they can tune them up. Yeah. I also very much think that one dynasty was sort of them throwing a lot of ideas at the wall and seeing what stuck and mm. a lot of them stuck. Um, but also all of them still feel very focused on what the original idea of the class was. So for wizard, like, how is Wizard always won games, pretty much? Like, how has Icelander won games? How has Kano won games? They do it by casting a big, giant arcane spell, right? That the opponent can't defend with. Because, I mean, typically it's because they don't have the resources or the cards in hand to do anything about it. Yeah. Because they're doing everything at instant speed while these are Wizards that play more on their turn. Thank you, LSS. Fucking thank you. Oh my god, I needed that. <laughs> like... I needed to be able to swing for lethal and not be like, let's see if they kill me. Let's see if they have it. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, they're still trying to throw this arcane spell for like 10 damage. And it's like, yeah, I can get through all your arcane barrier and all your spell void and kill you still because I cast a big fuck all arcane spell. It was what they were doing in the past. And it's what they're still doing now. It just looks a little different. And it's still complicated. You know, like that was something I think that drew people to wizards in the past. You you look at Asilio and tell me that he is a much simpler version of wizard. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, he is definitely not a simpler version of wizard. I will say, though, Runeblade, you know, we've been talking about how like Dynasty was the breeding ground for everything, not for Runeblade. What they were setting up for Runeblade and Dynasty, they said, oh, no, that shit stank. And they got <laughs> rid of it. So... Runeblade in this set is no longer focused on non-attack and attack action synergy and building this like 50-50 deck space. Mm -mm. It is way more oriented around aura generation and destroying auras. So I think that is a really cool space for Runeblade to play in, especially with a card like Warmongers. Either like if this if these heroes were oriented around non-attack and attack action cards in the same way that Viscerai is, in that every single turn you have to be able to play both of them or you completely fall apart, they would have to ban warmongers. Like you are that one card invalidated an entire class. So removing 
them from having to play both is great. But at the same time, they have very expertly designed both of these new Runeblade heroes to still want to play both of them. Mm -hmm. The most powerful cards in Aurora are her non-attack action cards. Flicker Wisp, Sting of Sorcery, Arc Lightning, Burn Up Shock. Some of the most powerful cards in Florian once his hero ability is turned on. They're all non-attack action cards. So, yes, you are still being told run both non-attack action cards and attack action cards. It's just no longer necessary for you to play both on the same turn. And again, I think that is very important for the health of the class and the health of the game moving forward. Awesome. I agree with everything you said there, Clark. I think the only other thing I would add is that aura generation is also really, or an aura destruction is really cool to see in the context of like illusionists who have had a lot of auras mm -hmm. in the past, being able to add that into the game somewhere and establish Runeblade as like, an illusionist eater. Yeah, especially because we have already kind of seen that earlier with Runic Reclamation, the three mm -hmm. for seven that on hit can destroy an aura from an opponent and give you a rune chant. Now sort of making them kind of symmetrical effects or even just completely self-focused effects like Dirge of Deadwood, right? I think this is a fun space and I'm excited to see the next time that they revisit Rune Blades, what they'll do with it. Yeah, it definitely gives a lot of flavor as to like the role of Rune Blades and not just like a better version of Warrior with like Arcane or something or like a really tuned aggro deck. They've given it utility versus uh, oppressive decks like Illusionist. So I think a lot of people are like, oh, if it's an Illusionist meta, now I have this option instead of just like hoping that I play Viscera and don't see any of my direct counters. Yeah. Also, like revisiting the rune chant stacking stuff, I've mentioned before that that's like one of the most toxic play patterns in the game. And now they've centered it around hey, you have to attack first, and then you can start building your rune chants once you hit a threshold of, you know, decomposition uh, or like banishing earth cards. And in that way, makes this version of Runeblade a lot more healthy for the game. Yeah. I think they've really hit the nail on the head in how they have adapted all four of the main hero elements that we have seen on these hero cards. Mm -hmm. I think they've done a great job reimagining Earth, a great job reimagining Lightning. I think people are so revitalized to return to these talents and these heroes, both fans of them and people new to them. And I think that means that this has already been a home run set. Awesome. But of course... That can always change once we start getting into the nitty gritty CC meta and everyone starts complaining about the new top deck. So why don't we go ahead and jump into Yellow Pitch and Fuzzy, tell us a little bit about what you think the meta might look like next season. I think it's always fun to look at a new set and be like, all right, are these our new top tier champions? <laughs> Is this a Rosetta meta, truly, you know? Part the Mistvale had one of the strongest heroes we've seen in a long time. People are comparing Zen to the power level of the notorious powerful hero, star, Bravo star of the show, right? Mm -hmm. And Zen was dominating literally every format in the game. Zen was one of the strongest heroes, if not the strongest hero. So... It kind of gives you a question like, is that what we're going to see with Rosetta or is it going to be a bottom tier <laughs> list of bottom tier perpetrators? Um, one thing that makes the context of this set very interesting is we saw one of the biggest shakeups in the game's history with the ban list that was supposed to come out soon after the set released. But LSS was so concerned about the power level of Zen that they wanted to issue corrections, quote unquote, to the ban list and to the game before Rosetta released so that we all felt prepared to invest ourselves in Rosetta Heroes. Namely, they call this the book burning, mm -hmm. where they banned Art of War, Tome of Findall, Tome of Aetherwind, and a few other relevant cards that are able to create these large offensive overlaps, extreme offensive overlaps to get over your opponent's defenses almost no matter what they set up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in particular... The way that the quote-unquote book burning interacts with our Rosetta heroes, I think specifically we can look at the lightning heroes and wonder, like, would Aurora have been completely overpowered if Art of War, Tome of Findall were still in the game? Yes. <laughs> As someone who has tested a lot of Aurora, 
yes, Fuzzy, I curse LSS for banning the cards that would have made the hero broken. <laughs> a Celio with his extra action point synergies from Lightning could have really easily played things like Tome of Findle, Tome of Etherwind, drawn lots of cards, and potentially been a combo hero, the likes of which Kano is able to pull off, you know? But with, like, six more points of health. Yeah. Like, we have those boots that, the legendary boots... Lightning Greaves. Yep. And they're able to like give you extra action points just by playing a few instants. The sigils are instants. The sigils also give you other stuff. You're drawing a lot of cards. I could see like a sealer getting out of hand really fast. Yeah, you're bouncing them back to hand. You're shuffling them back into your deck. Every single time you play a new one, you get the action point. And then you play the tomes on top of that. Yeah, no, that's it's disgusting to think about. And in the other direction, you have Earth heroes that, in theory, need time to get set up in order to pull off big combo turns. Maybe Florian's trying to do a rune stacking plan, or Verdant's has this OTK build that's been running around. But those get a lot more viable when the meta is slowed down and aggro decks are put in their place, quote-unquote. Go sit in the corner. <laughs> hey, man. Here's a dunce cap. <laughs> So there's a lot of ways that the meta could be really impacted, right? Maybe our lightning heroes are not going to be at the top of the meta because they were balanced around cards that don't exist anymore. Yeah. Or the earth heroes be too strong. I mean, it's interesting because first things first, like we've had two giant meta shakeups within like a month of each other, which has almost never happened before. And are so you referring to like the banning of cards like Art of War, as well as like the set release itself. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. We have had both a massive influx of new cards and a very large uh, removal of cards that were already established, both of which could have been giant, massive meta shakeups in and of themselves. Like just one of those announcements could have completely warped metas. We've had two of them within a month. I think... Everyone is scrambling to figure out the meta. This is an open mm -hmm. meta right now, primarily because nobody knows what the fuck is going on. Mm -hmm. And very true. It's really going to be this first tournament where people finally start like having opinion. I'm sure like pro, pro teams have already started settling on some opinions of cards, sure, and opinions of the meta. But like, in terms of what you're going to see at Armories for this next month. It's going to be wacky, boys. This episode is always fun to record because it's like you toss a bunch of cards up in the air, right? And that's where we're recording. And there's the potential that like they all fall and it's like, oh, it's Verdant or whatever, <laughs> right? Like by the time that this episode is released, it could be that the meta is all solved. Who knows? But mm -hmm. maybe there's some boogeyman right around the corner. But it seems really open to me. And I think like part of the reason it takes, it, it, it always takes a long time for a new set to be figured out, right? You remember Zen himself, when Mistvale first came out, people did not believe yeah. in the power of Zen. It wasn't until like a couple scrim games between some pro teams that were on YouTube that people were like, oh, Zen might be really strong. And then it was like, a week or two before Nats, where people were like, yep, gotta invest in Zen, Zen is the de deck to beat. Like, it takes time to figure these things out, even with, like, huge power level heroes like Zen, who's an aggro hero, that should be, mm -hmm. like, easy, right? In quote, in theory. And then there's also always got to be an adjustment immediately after, right? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people were almost angry at LSS for, like, not banning Bonds as soon as they could have. Mm -hmm. But I kind of agree that LSS should always wait to see how does the meta and how does the community respond to mm -hmm. a new top deck in the meta? If there are enough tools to deal with it, even if it's, you know, a little unfair, you kind of want it to stick around. You want people to be able to adapt and use their card pool and express their knowledge of the game and use that to get an advantage. Exactly. You want to have the, let the meta have that conversation. It takes time to play out. Communication takes time and effort. And with this set in particular, we have wizards. Wizards that, in theory, are a lot harder to figure out and will take longer. I even feel like Aurora is in a similar boat, and maybe to a lesser extent Florian, but like these are weird heroes that interact with the game differently than we're used to seeing, and it can take a long time for people to figure out what the best strategies are within that hero, even separate from like the meta itself, and how does my hero beat the meta? How does my hero win in general? Mm-hmm. 
So it might be a while before like a Celio or Verdans is like on the top tables. I know right now what we're seeing is like huge combo turns. We're like, okay, I can figure out one good turn. <laughs> if I can figure out how to line up one good turn, that's how I'll win. So Verdans has this combo with like rampant growth, rampant growth, plume of ever growth to grab my rampant growth, crack a couple healing pots before that to make my healing go up, and then I do like surge and ether tide. Like those are the combo pieces that we've seen in Verdans. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will be like good enough to win games, but there's also like counterplay to it, and it's a slow strategy. So there's a lot that we've left to see. Yeah. Do you to think that any of the new heroes from Rosetta are going to have a place at the top of the meta anytime within, say, the next three or four months? I think people are going to try and figure out how to be Verdance, and I don't think any of the other three Rosetta heroes can beat Verdance reliably with how much life gain she has and how consistent the combo of rampant growth is. That's my take. Yeah, I'm definitely looking at the Earth heroes before I'm looking at the Lightning heroes. There's still always a chance, you know, a, a Majin Bay type just comes out and with the most cracked Auxilia list you've ever seen, running cards that you never would have considered before and, like, break it wide open. But I've spent a long time in the Aurora Discord looking at a lot of lists and doing a good amount of testing. And I just don't think that she has the tools that it needs to be a top deck in the meta. I, I think KO can still outpace her with better equipment block and disruption. I think he also has the ability to run more flexible tools, like the two for six disruptive pieces, which will mean that KO can play better into the wider meta than Aurora can. So, like, I don't think Aurora is going to unseat KO as S tier aggro. With all the damage going lower, I think Enigma is going to rise up as this insane power piece. I mean, I'm just generally dooming right now about <laughs> defensive decks. They are looking incredibly powerful, and if you take away the best cards at creating offensive overloads, then defensive decks are going to do great because you can no longer go over the top of them as well. It wouldn't be Pitch It To Me podcast without Clark dooming about defensive <laughs> decks. <laughs> I'll do it every time. <laughs> But I think this is a really valid concern, and it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Take away the aggro tools. Oh, look, control gets to rise up, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, how about that? Yeah. I think it's also... It, it could make for some fascinating gameplay, though, of people navigating around these big combo turns and life gain throughout the game. Like, it, it can be really, really spicy, I think. There's one card that I think... I want to talk about it's a generic that seems to be making some waves among deck builders and seems like the most talked about generic lately and maybe that's just because of the bias because of the people that i surround myself with but that card is count your blessings <laughs> like i know talon our riptide fatigue enjoyer has been talking about how he's trying to run count your blessings in a couple lists clark has posted some deck lists where like people are running count your blessings like i've seen reinar running count your blessings yeah it's like what a backwards world that we live in when reinar is <laughs> making like is like a really good hero for running count your blessings and if you haven't seen it before, it's the card that gains you life, increasing based on the number of Count Your Blessings in your graveyard. So if you run all nine, and you play every single one of them, in theory, you should gain like 54 life. Yeah. It starts two card, two resources under rate. So if you think of it, they're, it's an instant, and if you compare it to Sigil of Solace, uh, Sigil of Solace is a zero-cost instant gain three life. Count Your Blessings at red is a two-cost instant gain three life. So it's not very good. But the moment that you have two cards titled Count Your Blessings in your graveyard, well, then it's on rate because it's two resources for a five life gain. Which is already more life gain than we've really seen in any instant that's generic before Rosetta. Yeah. And then it can get bigger and bigger and bigger. So like this can easily become a massively overrate card, especially in the late game. If you're an aggro deck where you're like, oh, I just need to get that one last little bit of damage to beat the defensive deck. And then they go, count your blessings, gain 13. And you're like, Jeez. no, my pitch stacked turn. You can't gain 13 <laughs> off of count your blessings. <laughs> Not 13. You'd have you to play two 12. of them. My apologies. You can't gain 12. It's three plus... Oh, three plus eight in graveyard. 
So 11, 11 the which is still a lot. You're right. You had to walk me down two numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I was being very hyperbolic there. My apologies, <laughs> audience. I was misleading you. Well, that's kind of my point. I think that people are over evaluating count your blessings. And again, this might be my bias in two different ways. One, in the circles that I've been in, people are really hype on this card and maybe they're more hype than the average community member. Maybe you've never even heard of this card because normal flesh and blood players don't think about this card. I don't really know. Two, I think I'm a little biased because I tend to have positive experiences when my opponent tries to gain life. As an example of this, this is really anecdotal, right? I played against Colin in the pre-release and he gained 41 life over the course of our limited game, but I still Jesus. won by dealing... 61 points of damage over the course of the game because I'm like, okay, I'll just try to swing my weapon a little bit more, be really efficient with my attacks. If he's planning on stalling me, there are adjustments I can make to my game plan. And I've also kind of felt that in anecdotally the games that I've played online and with Talon whenever he plays Count Your Blessings. Now there's a really big asterisk to that. Like I really haven't done that much testing. I haven't been playing against Count Your Blessings a lot, but my vibe just instinct wise is like, I'm not that afraid of a deck that plays a lot of life gain. Now, there are like strengths to gaining a bunch of life. If I play Wounded Bull, it's a three for eight, right? Even if I'm down on life. And it's eight points of value that is interactable. I can let my opponent decide, am I blocking that damage or am I taking that damage? What's better for my gameplay at the time? That's part of what makes Flesh and Blood so fun. Your opponent's throwing numbers and you get to decide how to interpret those numbers, whether you're doing you're matching defensively or you're taking it to do, do more numbers offensively and count your blessings in one way removes that choice from your opponent. When I gain 54 points, quote unquote, of value from count your blessings, it's not interacted with. You don't get the choice to say, how do these numbers impact the game? They are going straight to my life total. You cannot block my life gain. Mm -hmm. But the downside to that is Count Your Blessings cannot interact with your opponent's numbers. If I throw a bunch of numbers at someone running Count Your Blessings, then they are probably just going to play Count Your Blessings in response. Like maybe they'll play blocking cards, but they are deciding to have fewer options that say, I'm going to block your damage. And so I think that can lead to a big shift in how decks interact with each other. And I can understand being scared of that shift if your decks are used to playing Flesh and Blood in the quote-unquote old way. I think Count Your Blessings could have an impact on the meta for sure. I'm skeptical that it will be like the number one deck, that it'll be like a card that needs to be banned, which yeah. I've had per I have heard people say that. Yes. It is me. I am people. <laughs> Those are my opinions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to doom on the card a little bit, I would say that Count Your Blessings in a vacuum is not a terrifying card. Count Your Blessings is a terrifying card when you consider the fact that people can run 74 card piles with 12 D reacts, mm. that is the issue It the way that I have described it is okay. We just had offensive overlap and a big conversation about what does it mean for there to be an offensive overlap? But now I think we need to consider the fact that there is a very strong defensive overlap in the game. The ability to simply prevent more damage than your opponent could ever conceivably possibly throw at you. Now, count your blessings. I will not pass any official judgment on until it has, one, established itself as a meta threat, and two, we have seen how the meta adjusts to it. So mm -hmm. I think LSS is really expecting... Like, if you actually take limited Rosetta with life gain, I think you can kind of see sort of what the game plan is into it. In Sealed, when I was playing against decks that gained a ton of life... I was trying to throw my weapon a lot more mm -hmm. and I was trying to pitch multiple cards, including my reds to throw larger numbers that the opponent was encouraged to block with. And then eventually they just wouldn't have the damage to kill me because my life total was also high because I was playing Florian and I was also gaining life. Mm -hmm. I was presenting more damage while still gaining life. And because I won on the deck restriction, I was doing okay, right? Because I was doing more deck damage by attacking their life total by pitching. So I wasn't spending a card really to have that happen. But again, deck sizes can come into it. If I'm playing an aggro deck, I have to keep a lot of tools in my sideboard for all the different strategies I may run up against. Sure. If you're just, I'm not going to take any damage this game. You can run that in every single game of Flesh and Blood. 
you never really need to have an intensive sideboard plan into everybody else. So I, all of a sudden now, how many times do I need to swing with weapon to start to even out deck sizes? I can definitely see how fat decking would be the, like, a very nice way to play Count Your Blessings, you know? I think that is an idea that goes really firmly in line with the strategy. Yeah. It leaves yourself open to other things, too, you know? Like, the more cards you bring into your deck, the less consistent it is. Mm -hmm. Count Your Blessing is most effective when you draw it, especially, and draw many copies of it. Yeah. Also, especially drawing it late game, right? That was one mm -hmm. thing I mentioned. Like, it is most powerful when you play the red right at the end of the game. That is when the card is at strongest. If you can end the game before that, it's no big deal. But we just lost all the cards that let us do that. Yeah. So it, it's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. I'm really excited to see what the pro players do with it. Cool. Anything you want to add, Joel? Yeah, I think this card's getting banned. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, okay, we'll think Joel about it. Joel is right? also like, people. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely people. Like, think about it. If every deck already runs Sync Below because there's literally no downside to running it, why would it not be the same case for Count Your Blessings when you increase your virtual life by the same amount? Like, sure, if both people run, like, the same nine copies of a card and maybe three more for Remembrance to cycle, like, some action cards that let you uh, go over, you know, or, or go into second cycle and still be able to, like, kill your opponent, like, by pitching uh, into weapon swings. Like, that's 12 slots of every deck that is already accounted for, not including defense reactions or, or like, the core like cards of your deck and to me that just doesn't sound fun and it especially invalidates like basically every mid-range deck like i was um playing as bolton versus tekla Boston, which is normally not that bad of a matchup and he ended the game at like i don't know like 60 health and he didn't even like turn into like super tekla or whatever like his specialization super duper <laughs> tekla <laughs> yeah like he didn't even need to do that because he can just block with all of his armor and keep gaining life over the the damage that did land because he was just spending the whole game blocking and then he just pitched to the, like these big ass attacks which other decks might have more tools versus uh life gain like i think people were saying dory is a really good counter because you can at least scale with dawn blade mm -hmm. but yeah you still need to like play cards to give go again which like uh, i don't know D to me like I think there's just a, a really weird amount of variables that make this extremely toxic in the current metagame. So until we get more aggressive tools or more like real cards to deal with life gain and not fucking poison the well, like this is going to be a problem. Yeah. A again, I don't think that we can or even should be passing judgment until we have both seen it prove itself and then also seen everyone's adjustments to that. Like, I think we really do need to wait for a couple major tournaments before we can truly say anything about the state of the game. And I would also say, if, if, if we're trying to keep on the prediction theme for this episode, <laughs> I would predict that LSS wouldn't ban anything until the second major tournament. All the discussion. I'm, saying, I'm, really not, I'm really glad I'm not playing Worlds this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The blue pitch. Yeah. Time for our recap. We're basically going to go through our script of our Pitch and Predictions Part 1 episode, but lightning fast. We're going to be keeping track of points. Yeah, so looking back at our notes for Blue Pitch, um, I think we all kind of took the joke in Part the Misfail of the way to win Pitch and Predictions is just to make more predictions than everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I think we all kind of took that a little bit too much to heart because we made a lot of predictions. Yeah, there's so much. All right, take it away, Joel. All right. Starting off, um, I made the prediction that Verdance was going to be focused around large arcane spells. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. I mean, in the way that Amp is there... And she's got the tree, and the one playstyle we've really seen that I've seen so far is like you play rampant growth, and then you do surge and ether tithe, and you do one really big arcane spell. I'll give you the point. Cool. Uh, yeah. 
Next, I predicted uh, very expertly that Snapback and Gaze the Ages would be really strong in Divert and CC. Yeah, that didn't <laughs> happen. You were so yeah. confident, Joel. This was such a big deal. Yeah, yeah, you were like, wizards do everything at instant speed. Why would yeah. they suddenly break the mold for that? Who, who would have thought that the guy who's never played wizard uh, would get the wizard picture <laughs> correct? Uh, so yeah, no points there. Next, we uh, have Fuzzy predicting that Verdance's uh, weapon would banish Earth cards. That yeah. would have been so much cooler than what we got, honestly. That was a prediction that you made for both of the Earth heroes, that they would have decompose on them. Neither came mm. true. Yep. Next, we have Clark that predicted Verdance would deal arcane damage. No amp. Yeah, on the staff. And uh, very Wolf. wrong. In fact, it like its first line is, I think, amp one. Yeah. <laughs> Next, Clark predicted that Verdance would uh, deal arcane damage based on number of times gained life. And this, says, this is for the missing meld majestic that yeah. we hadn't seen that would become rampant growth. Yeah. So how, how close did I get on this? <laughs> it does, in fact, uh, deal arcane damage based on life gain. Mm -hmm. But you specifically said number of times gained life. Yes. I thought they were going to be putting a larger emphasis on that both in her card pool and on because like uh, it, it just looked that way from the hero ability and the yeah. heartbeat of Candlehold. I'll give you a half point. Yep. No, I'll Me take too. a half point. Next, Joel predicted that Florian's playstyle would be centered around rune chants and cryptic crossing would also be strong in CC decks. Rune chant thing came true. Making double tokens is like a very big part of the hero ability, though I don't know how central it is to like Florian winning the game. I guess it is. Germinate. Yeah, and it was also specifically mentioned by LSS in that article. Yeah. So I'd say this is credible. Yeah. Slave. And Cryptic Crossing is probably not going to be that strong, so I'm not going to bother with that one. <clears throat> Next, Clark predicted that both Runeblade will not care about pitching or playing non-attack actions. Wow. Yeah, that mechanic was garbage, and they did away with it. <laughs> but also playing non-attack actions. Like, yeah. That was a cool prediction, and you got it on the money. Mm -hmm. yep. Next, Clark also predicted that the weapon will be a non-breakpoint that makes an embodiment. And... Did not come wrong. true. Yeah, no, it's just a worse Nebula Blade. <laughs> uh, it's better. <clears throat> Next, I predicted that it would be an expensive weapon, but reduced burger and chance, and that did not nope. come true. You guys are designing cool weapons. They were like, let's keep yeah. the weapons simple for this complicated set. Yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, next, uh, Clark predicted that Asilio Sigils would appear as a defensive card given to both wizards. Did not happen. Yeah, I had this idea of sigils being this defensive tool that would get a sigil of protection reprint, and they went a completely different direction with sigil as an idea. Yeah. So, unfortunately, no points there. Then Fuzzy predicted that Asilio uh, would make sigil tokens that are uh, made by other lightning wizard cards. There aren't even lightning wizard cards in the set, really, <laughs> other than like a specialization. And even then, like, it's just lightning. Yeah. And yeah. while sigils make tokens, the sigils are not tokens in and of themselves. Yeah. So we have our first Pitch It To Me podcast audience member prediction in Old Barnacle saying that Brainstorm will be the win condition for Ocilio. It was the very first thing that we saw, right? Like the very first video that was ever done by, on Ocilio by uh, Sneet Media, our good, our good buddy Eric over there, was all about like a Brainstorm pitch stacked win combo. But... It doesn't look that solid. I think most lists are now incorporating a lot of attack actions and instances and not really drawing a lot of cards. So unfortunately, I'm going to say no points on that one. Yeah. Next, N21LV uh, predicted that Asilia will have a way to play instances from Graveyard. That would have been cool. Yeah. Can't that play it from Graveyard, but can recur from Graveyard, right? With Etchings of Arcana, which seems to be an important card for Asilia. Next, I predicted that Aurora will be really cringe and the best deck in the set. And that's looking like it's wrong. Yeah. Poor Joel. This was also like you made this prediction before the book bannings. So yeah. You probably could have been right. You were that I close. had full knowledge about like Tome of Fendel and uh, Art of War. So like, <laughs> but uh, anyways, didn't didn't translate. Mm -hmm. Next, Clark predicted that the missing Meld Majestic was going to draw cards equal to the amount of instances of arcane damage you have dealt this turn. That's actually and correct. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> the card sounds so freaking strong. Well, with like arc lightning, right? But this was before we knew about arc lightning. This was yeah. just like... Even just in general, you play three rune chants, like they have to block it. Yeah, but now you're playing a lightning hero who's making rune chants? <laughs> fucking weird. Yeah, I'm so glad you were wrong about that. Next, Joel and Clark both predicted that decomposed costs will now always need two earth and one action cards. And we were both wrong. And this uh -huh. is funny because I was really agreeing with you guys, but I want but you guys made me uh, <laughs> take a stance <laughs> opposite you. So I said that decomposed cards will always need exactly two earth and one action card. We even have a little note here of but he doesn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but I get the little, point. <laughs> little does you know, past Fuzzy got the point. <laughs> this is why everyone should just make predictions during these episodes. <laughs> Next, Fuzzy predicted that uh, there will be no Earth Bond and Lightning Bond. Or no, this was another instance of me and Fuzzy being opposed. Fuzzy was like, Earth Bond and Lightning Bond will be in the set. Well, I was like, there's no way these are going to be in the set. And Clark was right. Mm-hmm. They did not bring Earth Bond and Lightning Flow from the First Strike decks into the main set itself. That makes sense. It makes uh, First Strike decks that much more valuable. Clark predicted that Lightning will get a card that gets a bonus if it has go again. And that was really correct. Which card? Really? Oh, I guess like gone in a flash kind of. Because no, like, that's a, those are pseudo. I think you were trying to say that like a card will be like, if this has go again, it gets plus one. Yeah. Which we haven't oh. really seen that type of effect. We have seen cards that really want to have go again. <laughs> yeah, gone in a flash, <laughs> like very, very valuable for it to have go again. I would say even like Blast to Oblivion, very important for that to have go again. But not like what you were talking about. No, not really. Rip. Conversely, I predicted that a card will get a bonus that uh, if it loses go again and we haven't seen that yet unfortunately like you consume the go again on the card to get like plus yeah. one or something which would have been so cool if you could like stack go again on a card <laughs> i want them to finally give us a reason to stack go again on a card fuzzy predicted that lightning will have tokens that deal damage on and on hits and that didn't come true unfortunately fuzzy was like I want tokens in the set. <laughs> Give me all the little fucking things to play with. Instead, we've got cards that are basically tokens with these sigils. <laughs> Next, I predicted that there will be a card called Zip Zap. And there was not. Zap. We'll have to wait no for balls. Zip Zap to get, <laughs> get printed. <laughs> yeah. Moving on to legendary equipment, Clark predicted that Runeblade will have a resource generator generic Runeblade chess piece that gives two resources, not one. Nope. No, but Rob. Fuzzy ended up being right when he predicted that ge that there would be a generic Runeblade headpiece. Legendary headpiece. Yeah. Legendary headpiece specifically, yeah. So Fuzzy on the money, <laughs> knowing that it would be the headpiece, not the chess piece getting replaced. Because now Runeblades have like a complete set of legendary gear. However, I did not get the prediction right that they would print a uh, crown of candle hold as a headpiece. So. Which is so lame because that was such a cool idea. <laughs> like the queen was dying. Like <laughs> crown a new queen. <laughs> Florian should have been crowned king at the end of the Rosetta Lord. No, Florian should have been crowned queen of Candlehold. <laughs> <laughs> Florian should have been crowned queen of Candlehold. Next, uh, somebody by the name of Gorganian Granola predicted that Earth Wizard life gain to upset Fandal in the chess slot. Yeah, uh, hoping for a chess piece that synergized with life gain, which did not come true. That would have been sick, though. Mm -hmm. Next, Fuzzy predicted that there would be an Earth equipment that banishes itself. There's a lot of good ideas here. Just waiting <laughs> to be like, seen in a really weird like custom Rosetta format or something. <laughs> yeah. But no, uh, they did give a lot of the earth equipment like blade break so that it could like go to graveyard and yeah. then get banished very easily as a nice way of uh, being able to boost the amount of earth cards in graveyard, but nothing that sends it straight to banish itself. Yeah. They really only let you banish from decompose effects almost. Mm -hmm. uh, next Clark predicted that there would be a legendary generic equipment with arcane prevention and it'll be the most expensive card in the set. Let's go baby. Which one? Uh, Arcanite, the Arcanite chess piece. Oh yeah, Spell Void. Yeah, it's got Spell Void on it. Oh, oh, and you got the next one right. There will be another legendary equipment with Guardwell. Let's wow. go! You get two Damn. points for that. Yeah, two points off of one card being printed. LSS wants me to win this. However, I'm gonna stomp out your flame because you are wrong about attack action meld cards. Yeah, they really <laughs> didn't print a ton of meld cards. It it was really only yeah. eight in the whole set. 
if that, yeah. I one, think six. Well, no, one, you're right. Eight. Yeah, one rare for each hero, one majestic for each hero. Fuzzy said that not all meld cards will have life or shock. And <laughs> yep, they all Brown. do. Talon, who counts as the pitum audience, predicted that <laughs> Meld would have both an attack reaction and a D react, which was such a weird <laughs> prediction. You mean you mean cool and interesting, an interesting on, prediction? No, it was behalf, weird. I can call him weird. <laughs> on behalf of all judges, I'm so glad he was wrong. <laughs> oh my god, yes! What a nightmare that would be. Um, next, I predicted that, like take it on the chin, prevention effect. There, there would be a, pre a prevention effect that makes a token. And I was correct. Yeah, you did. There's that really? Runeblade Majestic. It's a block card. Oh, yeah. But as an instant, you can discard it to prevent two damage. And if you did, make a rune chant. Yeah. And you know, there's also the wizard block, mental block. Oh, yeah. Which is the blue mm -hmm. two block that you can discard to prevent the next two and make a ponder token. It's super cool. They did return to the well of prevention and make it an offensive token. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. It seems to be working out pretty well. I see him showing up in lists. I think it's a yeah, cool they, effect. There's they're cool cards for sure. Mm -hmm. I also predicted that would, that there would be no overpower in Rosetta, but there will be D reacts and dominates. This so one is like, weird. There's there's D reacts, but there's also overpower. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah that was so they kind of just like. <laughs> Negated everything they said at that dev talk. Which yeah, is I remember when they told us they'd never mix. There will never be D react. No, this one has D reacts and blocks in it. Wow. Yeah, no, they totally went back on what they told us. Girl, yeah, get your no, shit together, LSS. <laughs> but there is a D react, so I'm going to take that half point. Thank you very much. What? <laughs> Whoa, hold on, hold There's a D react there. in there. I don't think that's enough. I think you should give yourself a third of a point because you said no overpower. There will be D-Reacts, and there will be Dominate. And we don't do <laughs> third points here. We don't do... Fuck. All right. <laughs> Next. He tried to slip that one in there. He's like, we got to keep going, guys. We got we to gotta move quickly through this. Get myself a half point. The next, one. <laughs> next, Fuzzy and Clark both predicted that there'd be no D-Reacts, Dominate, Overpower, or Block cards. There was three of those. There was three of those, Clark. We were so wrong. Yeah. You guys lose... Uh, <laughs> Three thirds of a point, <laughs> or three fourths of a point. Yeah. Every um, every set now, I should just expect them to put overpower in it. I'm like, does the set <laughs> have dominate? No. Expect it to get overpower. All right. Before we continue, guys, just a, a tally up. Uh, so far, the Pitum crew has a total of nine and a half points. Ooh. The Which host is winning? Clark by 0. 0.5. Oh, only 0. 0.5? How many points yep. do I need? <laughs> <laughs> you need uh, 0. 0.6. So wait, 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 wait. Where are we, where are we at then? It, so I have how many? You have three and a half. I have three and Fuzzy also has three. Wow. wow. <laughs> this is such a tight race. How much does the audience have? <laughs> zero. Oh, oh they'll get yes. next. <gasps> Our audience. All right, but starting off with the audience for this section, Equinox pre uh, predicted that there would be an AB substitutes. There was not an AB sub. Well, there kind of is not an There's AB the macro. substitute. There is the macro as a prevention effect, but that doesn't have a keyword to it. And we mm -hmm. did get Arcane Shelter. Does Arcane Shelter oh. mean that there is a new way of preventing arcane damage? And should we consider that? For this AB I mean, substitute? I like it Equinox, and I'd like to give her the point. <laughs> yeah, um, it is, it is about, specifically preventing Arcane. How about half point? No, I think Because it's not a point. major theme? It's, give it's the not point. an AB substitute. Equinox, you get the point. Joel and I have decreed. Next, Fuzzy uh, predicted that there would be a spell drain effect, whatever the hell that means. Yeah, I kind of had this idea of like equipment that have charge counters. You remove the counters to remove Arcane. It didn't end up happening, but it was one idea I had for what a possible next generation of Arcane Barrier could be. You can mm. listen to our last episode, did they? What it was. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Oh, I predicted oh, I that there wouldn't be an AC, AB substitute. And there isn't, but there is Arcane Shelter. I would give you the point here. I think like the set is defined, at least in limited, as like a lack of arcane barrier and a lack of arcane prevention. And there's some like generic prevention effects there to help help it and life gain, 
but there's no like specific counter to arcane damage. So mm. are you telling me that Equinox gets a full point for saying that there will be an AP substitute <laughs> and I get a full point for saying that there won't be an AP substitute? What are yeah, we? Is low. <laughs> the Catholics in the early 1000s? That is a little stupid. Maybe we should correct it to half a point for each. Sure. <laughs> There's only kind of an AB substitute. <laughs> I like how I got my little Catholic joke in there. <laughs> Next, uh, Fuzzy and I predicted that there'd be no fuse cards in the set. Yeah, and that was correct. There are no cards that fuse with one of the talents. Slay. Mm -hmm. uh, Next, Clark said that there will be fuse cards, much as the uh, yeah, uh, I took devil's the, advocate. Uh, I took the opposing opinion there. And I actually mm. still kind of stand by that. I think it would have been good to uh, see some fuse cards. For sure. Next, Fuzzy predicted that Brutal Soul and So Tomorrow would be reprinted. Nope. No. Next, Gorganian Granola pr predicted that Rifting would get a reprint. Yeah, I think, again, that focus on like wizards doing things at instant speed being very important. But instead, I think they just are giving wizards instance rather than being like, you can cast your non-attack action cards at instant speed. There was a card that has the same effect of Rifting printed at Lightning, but that's neither here nor there. Really? The eclect electromagnetic uh, impulse or whatever. Oh, the eclectic magnetism. Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next, Fuzzy predicted that we will see one or two generic elemental cards. Nope. We saw no wrong. generic elementals. And you and me, Joel, no generic elemental cards. Yes, sir. Next, Fuzzy predicted that... Phi would get a card. Yeah, these were for the Arsenal Zone predictions. Yes, so Fuzzy predicted that we would finally see a Phi card in the Arsenal Zone. <laughs> nope. Fuzzy doesn't know what, about LSS. <laughs> <laughs> I do sound really naive here. <laughs> but I do want to put this one right next to Joel's prediction that we would get an Uvia Ash, which I think did come true, right? The, the new mm -hmm. Ash card is for Uvia? Yeah, it is Uvia. Oh, and a card that doesn't help Dorinthia. No, I don't know don't, if I want to let you get two don't points. Don't me. Unsheath does not help Dorinthia. I would give you two points. <laughs> I, I don't want him to get two, because he just predicted two different cards in his arsenal zone. We could have done that, but we didn't because we followed the rules. I'm fine with giving him one full point, half point for each of them. He's got Moxie. I have to give it to him. No, don't <laughs> give it to him just because of Moxie. Because of Moxie. <laughs> <laughs> I like your go get him attitude, son. <laughs> you guys like are not going to be prepared for the next pitching prediction where I just predict like 10 cards in the arsenal zone and you're Over like, no, Clark, body. you have to stop it. It's like, don't worry, guys. I'll edit this episode. We'll make some bands if we need to. <laughs> if we need to. <laughs> like uh, Bang next Clark. Cl <laughs> <laughs> next, Clark uh, predicted that there will be at least three arcane defenses for various classes. And yeah, like, so that true. was three different classes would get arcane protection whether that was spell void or anything else assassin got their spell void equipment set with arcane barrier on it as well might i add mechanologist got adaptive dissolver which is a modular ab1 and illusionist got two cards with arcane barrier on it wow 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 yeah you fucking cooked there bro one two three Yep, so one point. <laughs> <laughs> what? <Next. laughs> but, but I predicted... I, I didn't just predict one I, correct card. I didn't just predict I, I, two you correct cards. After off about my two cards, you're like, oh, I get three points. I <laughs> predicted count of one, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven motherfucking cards in the arsenal zone. <laughs> yeah, that's... that's um, It's a made-up contest, friends. <laughs> one, one seventh of a point for each one. One point. <laughs> ne <Fuck> next... You guys. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, Atasis uh, predicted that there'd be an Arachne spec that won't make waves. And I don't think there was an Arachne spec in this one. They nope. got the uh, the equipment, though. Yeah. And it does uh, have a spider theme. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next, Alice predicted that Olympia and Prism and Ranger... Yeah, Alice just made a list of expansion oh, slots. Oh, I see. Yeah. They predicted that Olympia would get a card, Prism would get a card, Ranger would get an aim card, Victor would get a card, Dromai would get an ash. Well, Dromai got an ash. Dromai got an ash. 
Yep. One full point for the audience. <laughs> Um, Talon predicted that Riptide would get another fucking expansion slot card. And yep. God, he can't he keep getting it. away with it. <laughs> he can't keep getting away with it. Garrett, Garrett <laughs> predicted that Merchant would get an X Pack slot, and I thought it said Mechanologist, but <laughs> Merchant didn't. Actually, did he? Hold on. No, Merchant did not get one. I would even take a generic here. Yeah, no generic. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. That's a zero points. Next, Equinox predicted that there would be an ice card with no CC hero to use it. I was on the same boat, and I was just as wrong as you are. So your yeah. points. Uh, really great idea, though. Kind mm -hmm. of parallel to it is that we got a Earth Lightning expansion slot card that could not be played by any of the heroes in the set, right? Yeah. The Regrowth mm -hmm. Shock. Mm -hmm. um, very cool. So, like, I think uh, she was right on the money of, like, Something that isn't actually for the heroes in the set, but like is connected yeah. to the set in some way. The way I remember this one is Equinox thought that the ice card would be a preview for where we're going next. Mm -hmm. I don't think Regrowth Shock is us teasing that we're going back to Rosetta. No. Yeah. The last prediction uh, to bring it home, N21LV um, predicted that Betsy would get her signature weapon, Lilog. <laughs> no, there was no Lilog. All the Lilog doomers were indeed correct, but LSS still found a way to make them the bad guys in this situation by giving Betsy a very good specialization <laughs> card. I'm almost willing to give a half point. Yeah, because there was very much the, the intent behind it was Betsy is going to get something big for her, right? Mm. I disagree, but I'm outvoted and I'm okay with it. Half point. I wouldn't give any points here, but go ahead. Wow, you hear that? <laughs> he doesn't like you. Oh, I love you, and I want you to have your Betsy <laughs> signature weapon. That's not a signature weapon. <laughs> All right. Are you guys ready for the tally? Yeah, final whoa, 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 tally. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Can you break it down into hosts, too? Yeah. Who do you think won? Well, you were doing really well, Joel, and I don't think we caught up to you. Well, I, I was in the lead when we did the brief little stop in the middle there. And I, I will say I, I did pretty good in the back half of that, too. I got the two points for the legendary chess piece. Mm -hmm. It might mm -hmm. be me, Let's but y'all gave Joel a free fucking point <laughs> for the Arsenal Zone card. He earned it by being I only ambitious. Got, I only got one. <laughs> Not being willing to draw outside the lines. Also, are we still willing to say that, like, we're sure Unsheathed doesn't do anything for Dorinthia? What about dual wheel Dorinthia, huh? I'm pretty sure they're running Unsheathed in that build. So, anyways, uh, <laughs> the audience got four points. Ooh, um, they pulled it Buzzy. back. Buzzy got four points as well. <laughs> okay. Buzzy on par with the mob. <laughs> and in second place is. Clark Moore. No! <laughs> Is it because of the expansion slot card? How close was it, Joel? Uh, it may or may not have something to do with that. <laughs> no! Recount. I demand a recount. <laughs> Get me on the phone with the governor of Georgia, the, no, the governor, the governor of Georgia, the board of the you. elections. <laughs> Take the high road, Clark. <laughs> do you want $30,000? I will give you $30,000. I don't have $30,000. Have fun <laughs> on the high road, baby. <laughs> no! It's okay, Clark, you'll get to count win. next time. You'll get to keep yeah. the tally next time. Get in yeah. the comments. <laughs> get in the comments and fight for me, audience. I know I'm your favorite host number two. Clark is Whoa! rallying the voter base. Buzz. Buzz. I need everyone to show up outside of Fuzzy's house with signs. <laughs> and a fucking stamp. <laughs> okay, lightning fast arsenal zone. This lightning episode fast arsenal may zone. be two hours long. <laughs> uh, it's fine. <laughs> They love us. <laughs> All right, Arsenal Zone. Arsenal Zone is part of the podcast where we're talking about the cards we like, we don't like, or the cards that we don't really give a fuck about. Okay, and my card's Fertile Ground. It is cool because it's super underrate, and then when you fulfill the condition, it becomes on rate. And I like that because five life gain is actually a really big number, and I think it should be under rate to begin with. Yeah, and on rate life gain is like something we haven't really seen. Like, this is the most life gain we've seen in a long time, and it feels really powerful. Yeah. Great card and limited. Grab yep. your fertile grounds. Pitch Joel. them for late game. Pitch them for late game. Joel? My card is regrowth and shock. Stop printing fucking cards that, <laughs> for heroes that, don't, that are not fucking legal in the goddamn set. Stop printing <laughs> cards for heroes I don't play. What the fuck is this, LSS? 
No, <laughs> stop printing cards for heroes that just don't have legal playability in the set anymore. That's fucking stupid. Stop doing it. It's the flesh and blood equivalent of like modern masters, but just one card. <laughs> yeah. Yep. The card that I brought today, and I'm going to be signing and giving to each of you, is Runehold Release. <gasps> I haven't played that much limited, only one weekend's worth, one entire weekend, but I think this might be my pick for like best pack one pick one because this card is so good in both Rune Blade heroes. Because in Florian, you like really want it because Florian wants to make those Rune chants, and in Aurora, it allows you to play all these Rune Blade cards that feel like they were made for Florian, who's making Rune chants. <laughs> but really, it's all just generic Rune Blade stuff. Aurora can make Rune chants too, you know? Pop this, Rune Rager Swarm for three, go again, hit the high note, one for six. Good values. Good values. Wait, what's the card? Rune hold release. It's the arms piece that you can, as an action, crack it to make a rune chant. Oh, yeah. That card is so annoying. In my four pre-releases, I only got that card in one of them. <laughs> yeah, I got fucking dominated by that card. I was missing it a bit too, but it's pretty good. All right, thanks for potting with me, boys. Joel, congratulations on your fair victory. <laughs> that, that will definitely not be controversial in any way, shape, or form. You guys can't see it, but I'm raising the roof right now. <laughs> Dear God, put it back. <laughs> All righty, until next one, guys. Bye. Bye. Oh, and thank you to all of our listeners who submitted your predictions before. Hopefully you enjoy us talking about them again here. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Better luck next time, suckers. Pitch It To Me podcast is hosted by Joel Racinos, Clark Moore, and Fuzzy Delp. Our executive producer is Talon Stradley. Music is produced by Dylan Hulse. Logo is designed by Han V. And our sound mixing is done by Christopher Moore. Last but not least, thank you, the listener, for taking the time to listen to our podcast. Be sure to give us a follow on your favorite social media platform at Pitch It To Me podcast. 